This is my lazy beekeeping uh, presentation. Again, these are all online, so if you see a really good quote, you can probably get to it later. Um, I, there's a really interesting and silly movie um, back in probably the 80s called Rhodey, starring Meatloaf and Khaki Hunter and Art Carney. And Art Carney runs a fix-it shop, and Meatloaf is his son. And this is the motto of their fix-it shop, is everything works if you let it. Um, and actually, then they did the cheap trick song that Rick Nelson wrote, um, Neil, Nielsen. But anyway, they, um, I, I, I remember reading that, and it kind of made me angry at the time, because I thought, well, I work very hard at making things work, and I kind of resent them saying that everything works if you let it. But um, the older I get, the more I realize there's a flow to things, and if you get in the flow, it's a lot less work than when you're fighting it. And, and there is a certain amount of truth to that. If, an awful lot of things will work if you get out of the way and let them. And uh, so some of this is on how to, how to work less. Um, I, I, used, I ran from about you know, one to seven hives for, I don't know, 20-some years. And, and I worked pretty hard at it. I was kind of obsessed with bees, so you, know, you spend I suppose it's like kids, you know, you have one kid, it takes all your time. If you have two kids, can't possibly take any more. Um, so you keep getting more and more hives, and at one, three or four were already taking all your time. So it really can't take any more, but you do have to find some shortcuts, or you just can't get the work done anymore. So some of this will be some of my shortcuts. Some of it's just how I've changed things that um, seemed more convenient to me. One of the things I changed is I went to all top entrances and, and no other entrances, just top entrances. And I actually, you can see that's the entrance, right? There's a gap right there, and that's where all the bees are. Um, I did this mostly because of the skunks. That was my motivation at the time. But a whole bunch of other things came along for the ride. Um, it used to be I had to cut the grass in front of the hive where the bees couldn't even get in and out. You know, They're trying to get out, and the grass is in the way you have to mow the grass. I hate mowing grass, and I especially hate mowing grass right in front of the hives. Um, so I didn't really have to cut the grass because time, by the time the grass is this high, my entrance is this high. So by the time the grass is this high, my entrance is this high. So it didn't, it didn't seem to matter anymore if I cut the grass. I don't know about snow where you are. I don't get, we don't get a lot of snow, but when I do, I'm liable to get a nice warm day the next day, and they might get a cleansing flight in if, if I just had the entrances free. And if the entrances are at the top, they're always open, and I don't have to worry about them. If they're at the bottom, I have to shovel them out. If that's the only entrance I have, I have to shovel them out so that they can make that cleansing flight. Um, so I, I discovered it saved me that work. Mouse guards were always a pain. I have to go put them on all the hives. I have to figure out when to put them on all the hives, because if I put them on too late, the mice have moved in. If I put them on too early, they kind of block traffic. Um, I tend to use little quarter-inch um, hardware cloth uh, in the entrances and quarter inch hardware cloth if they're still hauling in pollen they tend to lose about a third of their pollen on the way in if I put them on too early if they're done hauling in pollen that works really well but if they're still hauling in pollen that kind of gets in the way so it's always a dilemma when do I put them on when do I take them off and and I don't have to worry about it with top entrances I don't put them on I don't take them off I don't have any problems with mice I know everybody thinks mice can climb up and in, in the top and you're right if there weren't any bees in there I think they would but Somehow, when they got to climb in the top and get past the bees to get back to the bottom where they really want to be, they just don't seem to do it. Um, I don't have any trouble with the mice getting in. The skunks were my main reason. Um, for those of you who've never had skunks, um, my bees were kind of not really taken off, and I was trying to analyze that, and I'm walking around the bee yard just trying to figure this out, and I see little soggy piles of dead bees on the ground. Well, that's usually your first indicator you've got skunks. What they do is they get in the entrance, they get down low because they don't like to get stung. This is kind of a sensitive area for them, but, but their top of their head's pretty tough and their pads of their feet are pretty tough. And so they scratch on the entrance and get a bee to come out and they catch it between their paws and they roll it in the grass and get it to sting the grass and then they pop it in their mouth. And then they repeat and they repeat until they get a whole mouthful and they suck all the juice out and then they spit them out usually. Once in a while they swallow them because once in a while you'll see some scat with some bees in it, but usually they just suck all the juice out and spit them out. And so that's how they work. Now, if you put your hives up higher, then they have to get up like this, and that exposes this, and they don't like that. 
well, that works all right, unless you live in Nebraska where you get 60 mile an hour winds and your highs blow over all the time when you put them up too high in the air. And not to mention you have to put supers on with a step ladder sometimes when you get too high up in the air. And, and for those of you who've never done that, um, putting them on is the easy part. Getting them off is the hard part because you can't put it in front of you because it weighs 60 pounds. So you're on the ladder this way, you'll fall off. If you're trying to do it this way, the ladder's in the way. And so you pretty much have to hold it over your head while you walk down the ladder and honey dripping on you and so on. Um, the other thing about a top entrance is not only do you get better ventilation, but if you think about it, what you, what you need both summer and winter is to get rid of moisture. In the summer, you need to get rid of moisture for two reasons. You're trying to cure honey, and it, you're, it needs to get rid of moisture in order to become honey as opposed to nectar, right? And, in, and also, in the summer, you need to evaporate water to cool the hive, and that evaporated water needs to get out so you can evaporate more water so you can keep it cool. When it's 110 outside and the brood nest has to be 93, they have to cool it. Um, in the winter, you've got the problem that they're producing moisture, and that moisture will condense on the, on the roof and drip on them, and now you've got wet bees, and wet bees don't winter very well. Um, so in both cases, I need to get rid of moisture. Well, lucky for us, moist air rises. Um, so we know what direction it's going to go if we let it. If we let the moist air out the top, it'll go out the top. If you, if, if we don't let it out the top, then the bees have to try and move it out the bottom, and that's not very easy to do in the winter because they're, they're not that active. And in the summer, they'd have to work at it, where if you just let it out the top, they don't have to work at it so much. Um, so I think you get better ventilation both winter and summer, and the other part that comes with the better ventilation I've got down at the bottom there, which is less condensation, because if you get that moist air out, then it doesn't condense and drip on the bees. Um, they're really cheap and easy to make. It's just a one-piece cover. And actually, that's also handier, I think, because it's handier for a number of reasons for me. For one thing, the, the, the cover is the exact same size as the hive, so I can butt all my hives up against each other for winter, and I don't have a telescopic cover sticking out in my way. For another thing, I don't have two pieces to deal with where I've got an inner cover and a cover. I've just got a cover. I don't have another piece to mess with. Um, the other thing about a top entrance is bottom entrances in the winter, if a lot of bees die, can end up getting clogged with dead bees. So uh, sometimes they can't fly because there's dead bees in there blocking the entrance. And you don't have that problem with the top entrance um, because the dead bees are at the bottom. I want to put my hive as low as I can because of the combination of the wind and I don't want to be lifting boxes so high. So it lets me go lower without having skunk problems and all the rest of this. Um, and, and that's an advantage. Well, I will say this, and you've got to take this into account anytime you're looking at somebody else's beekeeping system and you want to adopt one little piece of it. Um, there's, there's always ramifications to everything, and you need to understand what those ramifications are. If you only have a top entrance and no bottom entrance and you put a queen excluder in, then the drones have no way to get out. Um, I don't use a queen excluder, so that's not really an issue for me. But if you're going to do that, then you need to make sure there's a, at least a 3 8 inch hole below the queen excluder for the drones to get out. Now, that could be right below the queen excluder. Like, you could buy a bound queen excluder and cut a notch in the, in the wood binding, or you could buy a regular metal queen excluder and put a emery shim under it which could make a little entrance, or I hate drilling holes in my equipment, so I hate to even suggest that to you, but you could drill a hole in it somewhere. Um, you could even put a 3 8 inch hole in the, in, you know, you take a bottom board and block the entrance, you could drill a hole in that block just big enough for a drone to get out. Um, and odds are the bees aren't going to be real, ha real active using that one when the grass is tending to block that route, but at least the drones can get out. And, and if the bees aren't real active using it, usually the skunks won't bother it, and you'll probably be all right. But, um, so this is one of my covers. This is just a shingle shim. If you go to a real lumber yard, you'll have no trouble finding these. If you go to one of these pseudo lumber yards, they'll probably have them. I have been to some, though, where they didn't have a real shingle shim. They had these little shims that somebody made on a radial arm saw that were only like four inches long, and they weren't really a real shingle shim. A real shingle shim is a sawn cedar wood shingle that's been cut into inch and a half strips. 
and they use them for putting windows and doors in. And um, I, I have found them at Home Depot and Lowe's and whatever, but sometimes they didn't have them. They had some homemade thing that they made instead. But, uh, but this is a shingle shim. So I've got two shingle shims here, and I've nailed and glued them onto this piece of plywood. This happens to be three quarters. I like three quarters, but it's getting harder and harder to deal with a three quarter inch sheet. It, I tend to hurt myself anymore, so I pretty much gone to using half inch. Half inch isn't as stable, it'll warp more on you. And any of these might warp, depending on how much it rains and whatever. Um, I'd use a lot, I use a lot of bricks if it gets warped and just set them on the corners that are sticking up and they eventually get glued back down by the bees and then it straightens out. But um, this is upside down right now, we're looking at the bottom of it. When you flip it over, it looks like this. That's your shingle shim, which makes the gap. And then there's the entrance. Now, people often ask me, how do you reduce this? Well, I go buy a piece of uh, screen molding. Uh, screen molding is made for putting like a screened porch to nail on your screen to hold it. And it's 3 quarters of an inch wide by a quarter of an inch thick and kind of rounded on the edges. And you can usually not only get them at the lumber yard, you can even get it at the hardware store. Because the hardware store seems to always stock them because they sell screen and people are often using this to make a screen door or whatever. But anyway, I just cut it about two inches short of the whole thing and put one nail in the middle going up into the lid and then it'll pivot. You can pivot it around to make to open it or you can pivot it around to close it. Not that it pivots easily because they propolize it and you gotta break the propolis loose to pivot it, but um, at least I don't lose it. It's there when I need it and I can always just break the propolis loose, bend it back where I want it and, and it's there. Um, Anymore, I'm leaning towards just leaving them reduced all the time. I think I think we tend to over. I I think we tend to think that the bees need a great big opening, but when the bees never seem to be that interested in a big opening, and they're more likely to get robbed. They seem to do pretty well with it small. So um, I may put reducers on all mine. I may just nail them on and leave them reduced. I don't know. I'm still contemplating that. Oh, I've got about a two to two and a half inch opening there, and it's the shims make it about a between a quarter and three eighths inch tall. So you're talking about three eighths inches tall by two to two and a half inches wide. That seems to work pretty well. And I would make sure you always put them on the same side if you're going to do what I do and butt them all up against each other, because that way all the entrances are the maximum distance I can get them from each other. Because if I put them on, just randomly put them on different sides, then I could end up with two of them right next to each other, which might cause more drifting and confusion. Um, I think this is major. Um, having a uniform frame size greatly simplifies your life. It may be harder to explain unless you've been in that position uh, than, than it is, than how important it really is. But, um, I don't know how many of you have been in this position, but I used to have deeps and shallows, and here, here I am going into winter, and I've got a little bit of honey in the shallows that I'd love to give to them that I'm going to let overwinter in the deeps, but it's the wrong size frame. And um, it's the same with back when I used to use a queen excluder, which I don't anymore. If I wanted to get them to go through the queen excluder, I kind of need to bait them up to get them to go through the queen excluder. To do that, I'd take a couple of frames of brood and put them above the queen excluder. But since my, sh my supers are shallows, and my boxes are deeps, now I have to go find a, a another deep to put on there temporarily and a whole bunch of other empty fra deep frames to try and get them baited up and going through the queen excluder. And by now they started building some of those deep frames, which I don't want anymore because now I've got to take it back off to put those back down below. And, and it, it's just a, it's a juggling act that's not very easy. Um, when they're all the same size, it's much simpler. I pull those two frames of brood and just put them up in the next box because all the boxes are the same size. And when they're moving through the queen excluder, I take them back down and put them back down and grab a couple of frames of honey and move them up here instead. And, and it's just very easy to manipulate things. If, if going into winter, if they needed a couple of more frames of honey, and I've got some frames of honey, if they're all the same size, then they're on the right size frame. They're always on the right size frame when you only have one size. Um, so it pretty much eliminates the whole concept that, oh, well, this box is this, and this box is this, and now what am I going to do with this? And I say that, but then you'll go buy a nuke, and it'll be a deep, and you want to put it in your mediums, and, and you've got a problem again. But, uh, but having all the same frame size really simplifies your life. Um, I think I covered all that. Um, so I cut all mine down to mediums. Well, originally, I tried to go with all deeps, but um, 
I discovered 90 pound boxes full of honey weren't, what's, weren't something I wanted to manage. So I decided to cut them all down to mediums. So this is actually a deep frame. And I ran it through a table saw. This is the top bar. This is the bottom bar. I ran it through the table saw at six and a quarter and it just cuts this off. And then I ran these bottom bars through the table saw at three eighths and chopped the little, you know, it used to have a little ear that stuck out here that went into here. I just chopped all those off and then I just nailed them from here into here. So I cut all my frames down. Now, if you're not handy with a table saw, I would not do that. Um, it's not worth losing a finger over. But if you're already handy with a table saw and, and you know, you, you, you don't mind uh, doing some work, it's, it's not that hard to do. Um, the other thing besides the same frame size is lighter boxes. Um, yeah, friends don't let friends lift deeps. The, the hardest thing for me about beekeeping physically is lifting boxes. They're, you know, everybody says, well, if you go to, you know, eight frame mediums, you have twice as many boxes to lift. Yeah, and they weigh half as much. I don't mind that at all. It's the, it's the, it's the 90 pound box that's the problem. You know, you think, if the, the two arguments people give me that I, that I don't quite follow, but one of, one of them is that these are brood boxes, so they're never going to be full of honey. Well, either you haven't kept bees very long, or, or, or you're deluding yourself. I don't know which, but, because sooner or later they are full of honey, and they weigh 90 pounds when they're full of honey. And, and what's more is you pry that 90 pound box loose on all four corners and there's 90 pounds pushing back down on that propolis. And now I go to lift it and I end up lifting both boxes before the one underneath lets go and now I'm holding one box. Well, that, that's 180 pounds. I'm, and, and now I'm, when one falls off, I'm finally down to 90 pounds. None of that is acceptable. We, we live in a, in a society that uh, no other industry would dare have pieces that people were expected to lift that weighed 90 pounds. Anything over 50 would be considered too much. And, and yet they sell deeps and shallows all the time as the standard kit to get started in beekeeping. Um, I don't understand that. The other thing I don't understand is gravity is getting stronger every year and nobody pays any attention to this. The scientists aren't researching it and nobody's making adjustments. Yeah. Um, I just cut them all down, pretty much. Oh, well, come spring, you usually have an empty box you can just pull. Um, you got to kind of juggle things. There's, if, you, if I've got two deep frames, I got to figure out where to put, and, and, and that's all I've got left to worry about. I'd probably leave frames out of two mediums and let it hang down into this, and they'll build a little bit of comb on the bottom. If I had two, if I only, if I had more deeps and less mediums, I'd probably throw a couple of mediums in with the deeps. I can juggle it. Um, I can also just get everything I can. If I, once I get the queen on some brood on the other side of an excluder, I can wait for all the brood to emerge. I can move all the brood to the other side of the excluder, wait for it to emerge, and then just pull it all off. If it's full of honey, I'll harvest it. If it's full of nectar, I'll just feed it back to the bees. If it's full of uh, pollen, I'll probably just scrap it because I don't have an easy way to manage it, although I could probably cut it out and rubber band it into into frames if it's pollen, but honey is just not worth trying to rubber band into frames. I just harvest it. Does that make sense? So I kind of end up doing a combination of all those things depending on how many frames of what do I have that I need to put somewhere. Um, but that's, that's, that's pretty much how I transitioned. Um, I think the this is just the weights, 90 pounds for a deep, eight frames. An eight frame medium is 50. That's about what I want to lift. Um, if you want to, if you want to get a feel for this, and you're not, and you're not a beekeeper yet, and you, uh, and you don't know what 50 pounds weighs, go down to the hardware store and get two 50 pound boxes of nails. Don't hurt yourself, but try to pick those up without hurting yourself, and stop before you do because you probably will hurt yourself. Um, that's, that's 100 pounds, that's about what a 10 frame deep weighs. Now pick up one of them, that's what an eight frame medium weighs when it's full of honey, and that's still heavy. Um, so to me, that's about what I wanna lift. If it weighed a lot less than 50 pounds, I'd be tempted to pick up two of them. If it weighed a lot more than 50 pounds, I'm gonna get hurt. So um, that's about what I wanna lift. But if you wanna get a feel for what, what I'm talking about, that's what I'm talking about. Um, 
and an eight frame medium is the size that is 50 pounds. Now some people will say, well, why, why don't I just go with shallows? Well, there's nothing wrong with shallows per se, but one of the advantages to mediums though is there's just a lot more stuff available. There's, feet, there's medium frame feeders available. There's medium plastic comb available. There's medium plastic small cell frames available. There's a lot of things available in mediums that just aren't available in shallows. Um, and it's kind of a nice size. It's just small enough that the queen doesn't hesitate to move to the next comb without being so small that they're really, really tiny. Um, but if you can't lift mediums, shallows might be a good plan. But I, I went with eight frame mediums to get a little less weight while still getting all the options that I get with a medium. I can still get frame feeders and all that kind of stuff. So, so if you want to convert to mediums, the first step to do is stop buying what you don't want. Start buying what you do want. I know that's, it seems overly simple, but it's amazing how many people will tell me, well, I'm going to go ahead and buy these now because I'm going to do this later. No, stop buying what you don't want. Stop buying it now. <laughs> It's not that hard, just stop buying it. And then, then you can worry about what you already have later. But the sooner you make that decision, the, the sooner you'll get to where you want to be and the less money you'll waste on what you didn't want. Um, so just buy mediums and, and, and then you can cut down your deeps. You can cut down your deep frames if you want or you can, if you don't want to cut them down, sell them to your friends when you catch swarms, put them in your deeps and sell them to somebody and, and, and then you'll get rid of them. Um, you can add onto a shallow box. I've never figured out how to add onto a shallow frame, but you can add a little strip of wood onto a shallow box and make it into a medium. I've done that. Um, eight frame boxes, again, if you start buying what you want, you can mix, you can mix eight frame boxes with 10 frame boxes. If you just start buying eight frame boxes because that's where you want to end up, you can eventually work your way through either cutting them down or again, put a, put a swarm in them and sell them to your friend or whatever, um, and eventually get rid of all that stuff. You do need to think in terms of when you buy equipment, if you take care of it, you'll probably still have it 30 years from now. And you probably ought to take that into account when you're thinking in terms of, uh, oh, I can lift a deep. I'm, I'm, I'm young and strong. Yeah, well, you'd be surprised how fast 30 years goes by. <laughs> um, and you're still going to have that deep, and you, you, then you've got to do something with it. So there's some 8 frames, a 10 frame and an 8 frame hive sitting next to each other just to give you a frame of reference of what an eight frame hive looks like. Um, there are people who make the argument, well, an eight frame hive isn't standard. Well, an eight frame hive has been standard since the 1800s, so I don't know where they get that. You could buy, you have been able to buy eight frame equipment all the way from the late 1800s at least until now. So I don't know where anybody gets the idea that that's like non-standard equipment. It may not be as common as a 10 frame box, but it's not, it's not like they haven't existed for 100 years or more. Um, they've existed for at least 130 or 40 that I know of. Anyway, here's an eight frame on top of some 10 frames with a, a one by three 20 inches long on the, on the empty spot there. This is actually the way Carl Killian did his comb honey all the time. He ran a deep for his brood nest and then he, he would put a one by three on the side there and then he'd have eight frame supers, but that's because he wanted to crowd them into the supers. Um, he wanted to kind of funnel them up in there to get comb honey. Comb honey is something that's, it's, if you want two real challenges in beekeeping, one of them is raising comb honey and the other one's raising queens. But raising comb honey is trying to get a whole bunch of comb drawn really quickly so that it's really soft and white and the bees haven't had time to finish it. And then you get it out of there real quick and it'll just melt in your mouth. It's a tricky proposition, and I'm not sure, you know, whether it's worth the trouble to do in the long run is a, is, is a good question, but, but it's a challenge to see if you can do it. Um, and anyway, that's how he did it. He he'd funneled them up into the supers to get them to build that comb really quickly, so, and, and, and uh, then you try and take it before it gets that yellow color when they paint it and make it tough. You want to get it before it's tough. You want to get it when it's still at that soft putty-like wax stage. Um, but anyway, you can do this and mix eight frames with 10 frames and eventually cut the 10 frames down or trade them off with other people or even leave them on the bottom where you don't have to lift them so often. Um, this is me cutting down 10 frame boxes to eight frame boxes. I got a whole page on my website if you want to see all, all the step by step of the whole thing, but I just do the short version here. Basically, I just cut it at 13 and three quarters and then I cut it around to make it, to notch it into the 
frame rabbit. The reason I had to do that is so that I could use the same piece of wood because there's not enough wood there to go clear past and be square. So I have to notch it around because I do have enough wood to do that, but I don't have enough wood to go on past. Now, if I wanted to go buy another piece of wood at the lumber yard, I could do it with a piece that runs on past, but um, I was trying to not buy any lumber. So anyway, that's cutting 10 frames down to eight frames. I, I like this uh, quote for two reasons, I guess. The first one is the, the you know, even beekeepers grow older line. And then, the, and then the deep supers when filled are ponderous beyond practical limit. Taylor had such a, a way with words. Uh, I, I agree with that. They're ponderous beyond practical limit. Um, I'm going to talk about foundationless frames here. Um, this is actually one I bought from, I bought these from Walter T. Kelly with no grooves in them. And I cut a bevel on it. This is a V right here. Can you see the V? It's hard to see in two dimensions and, and, you know, but you see that angle there, that angle is the same on the other side. It's, it's a bevel. Um, I bought them with no grooves in them and then just cut the bevel on them. But now they're selling foundationless frames. You can just buy them from them and they have cut a bevel. It isn't quite as deep as this. It only goes a little ways across here, but it is a bevel and it works pretty well. Um, let's talk about why. I just wanted to show you the picture, but, um, how many of you have ever done wax, wired wax, where you crimped the wires and you embedded the wires and you, nobody? Wow. It's, a, it's an extremely tedious, time-consuming process, basically. And, it take, and you gotta buy a bunch of special equipment or it'll just run you nuts. If you don't get a spooler to handle the wire, then the wire will just be going everywhere. And if you don't buy a, if you don't build or buy a, a foundation board that you can lay the frame on, that is the right depth to have a board behind the wires so that you can lay the foundation on and embed the wires into the foundation that doesn't really work very well. And so, and, and you really need to get a good crimper and nobody even makes a good crimper. The crimpers they sell are terrible. They're like plastic things that just chew your hands up. And, and you really should crimp it for two reasons. If, when you crimp the, if you're gonna do foundation, if you crimp the wire, it's, it radiates the stress out through the wax in a way that when it's straight and not crimped, it doesn't do. If it's just straight, it kind of cuts through the, through the wax, but, it, but it, the, the stress is all on a straight line. And, and if, the, if, if it's crimped, it radiates that stress out through the, through the, uh, through the foundation. But anyway, I, I used, you know, I've done that, and it was way too much work. <laughs> um, one of the reasons for doing foundationless is it's a whole lot less work. Pretty much if I have a foundationless frame, if I bought one that already is a foundationless frame, basically I just put it together and I use it and I'm done. Just four pieces, nail it together and I put it in the hive. And if the wax moths ever eat it up because they went queenless or something, I just scrape it off and put it back in the hive. And I don't even take it back to the house. Um, to me, that's a lot less work. If I, have, if I use foundation and, I, and the wax moths eat it up, I gotta take it back to the house and go through the whole process again. Even worse, I gotta scrape it out and then I gotta scrape the groove out really good if it's grooved or pull the wedge off or whatever and I've gotta redo this whole thing. Um, foundationless is just a lot less work. The other, the other thing I get though, um, I get clean wax and I don't know of another way to get clean wax. If you buy wax foundation, it's already contaminated because everybody's putting poisons in their hives that's contaminating the wax. You've got Amitraz, Fluvalinate, and Kumafos all building up in the entire wax supply. Right now, the US, the US uh, cosmetic industry won't buy wax from the United States. They only buy wax from Africa because people in Africa are too poor to treat their bees. And of course, everybody knows if you don't treat your bees, they'll all die. So all those dead bees in Africa produce millions of tons of wax that the cosmetic industry uses. I mean, if only we could figure out how to make our dead bees that productive, we'd really be doing well. Um, so. Pretty much our entire wax supply is contaminated, and so all the foundation you buy is contaminated, and so you start out with contamination in your hive before you ever even get started. But if you do foundationless, then the bees build all the wax that's in there, and it's all as clean as it can get in this environment where they're spraying millions of tons of who knows what on everything. Um, but it's about as clean as you can get it. Most of the contamination that's in a hive is from the beekeeper, not from the, not from the farmers out there. As much as I'd love to get the farmers to quit spraying for pests, still most of the 
contamination in that wax is coming from beekeepers. Um, so I can get clean wax if I don't use foundation. I can also get natural cell size. Um, and you can argue all you want about natural cell size, but um, I couldn't get past the mite problem until I got on either natural comb and or small cell comb, and then I got past the Varroa problem, and up until then I just kept losing them to Varroa. Um, if you let them build the size they want, you're going to be in much better shape than if you're building, they're building the size that you coerced them into building. Um, and the foundation you buy has been artificially enlarged. We'll talk more about that later. Um, so how do you make foundationless frames? Um, you can uh, buy chamfer molding at a real lumber yard. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, they probably will just look at you funny and have no idea what it is, and you may not even be able to get them to order any, but you could try. Um, but if you go to a real lumber yard, they should know what it is, and if they don't know what it is, they can look it up and they'll order it for you. Chamfer molding is just a triangle. That's all it is. Um, and you can make your own if you're handy with tools and you've got a table saw. You just set the table saw at 45 degrees and set it so it'll just cut the corner off of a one by and you'll end up with a three quarter by three quarter by one inch triangle. And you can cut that to length and nail it on the bottom of a, of a, bottom, of a top bar and you'll have a, you'll have a guide that the bees will tend to follow. Now if you've already got, uh, everybody always asks me what my favorite foundationless frame is. My favorite foundationless frame is whatever frame I have in my hand. If it's, because if I've already got it, it's free. I mean, I don't have to go buy another one. So if it's, if it's a wedge top, I'll just turn the wedge and nail it back in, turn it this way so it sticks down instead of being level, and nail it back in. And if it's a groove top, I'll put a strip of wood in there, either one I ripped on the table saw or a piece of, of uh, paint stick that's been ripped down the middle or a uh, jumble craft sticks from the craft store that look like tongue depressors to me, but for some reason they're jumble craft sticks now, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, they work fine. You put about two and a half of those in there. You can even just put two in and then break the last one off and it doesn't have to be perfect and, and glue or nail it in there or both. Um, any of those will work. So um, the point is you want to make an edge. The bees will hang in a festoon off of an edge and they'll tend to build the comb on that edge. So if you don't have an edge down the middle of the comb, they probably won't follow it. If you just stuck a bunch of frames in there with nothing on there, they'll, they'll build the two nose wear. Uh, they'll probably build off of the corner of one of those because that's an edge, <laughs> even though it's not the edge you wanted. But if you put something down the middle of the bottom of the top bar, then that makes an edge, and they tend to want to build off of that edge. So um, you can do any of those things to make an edge and they'll tend to build off of that. Now the other thing is anytime you feed an empty frame of any kind in between two drawn brood combs, they tend to draw a perfectly straight comb right in the middle on that frame. So that works fine too without putting any kind of a comb guide on the frame. You can just put it between two other combs and they'll act as a guide. Um, now I said brood combs. Um, it won't, won't necessarily work in a honey super if they aren't capped. If you stick an empty frame in a honey super and these two, these two frames aren't capped and you put this empty one in the middle, they'll just keep drawing these, these uncapped ones out until they almost meet in the middle and they're, un, they're actually sticking into where this frame is because they already had them started and they don't care how thick honey is. They do care how thick a brood comb is because a brood has to be a particular depth in order to raise a baby bee in it. But honey doesn't have to be any particular depth. They'll just make it really fat. And uh, that doesn't always work so well. Just in case you ever find yourself in that position, in case you're foolish enough to do what I did and to take empty drawn comb and intersperse it with uh, empty frames in a brood nest or, or in a honey super, now you can't pull any of the frames out because it'll just rip everything to pieces. You flip the box upside down, lift the box off, and now you can pull the frames off the end and you don't have to rip it through all the honey coming up this way. If you ever get a really cross combed box anyway, that's a good plan. You know, if the bees built some wild thing in there and you can't pull any of the frames out because of the way it's all built, just flip it upside down, take the box off, and then you can work it from one end or the other end and, and, and do a cutout, do whatever you need to do. A cutout's where you cut the, if it's brood, you cut it out and you rubber band it into another frame straight, 
because it wasn't straight, right? You rubber band it into a frame, just put rubber bands around the frame so it can't fall out, and then you put that back in a hive, and I'd scrap the honey. It's not, honey is just too messy to try and do a cutout on, but brood's worth doing a cutout on. You can cut out all the brood and put it back in and harvest all the honey, just throw it in a bucket and crush and strain it later. Um, so anyway, that's how you straighten out a mess if you make a mess. Um, no chemicals, no artificial feed. I'm just talking about it from the point of view of saving work here. We'll talk about it more from the point of view of the health of the bees later. But um, if you use no chemicals, um, obviously you don't have to make, you don't have to go out to the bee yard and put these strips in and go back out to the bee yard and take the strips out and you don't have to buy them and you don't have to do all that work. The other thing about the artificial feed is if you leave them honey for winter, then that's that much less honey I have to harvest, and I, and I don't have to make the syrup, and I don't have to take the syrup out and feed it, and I, and I don't have to set off all the robbing that the syrup's gonna set off, and then I, have to, then I don't have to deal with all the robbing issues that I created, and then um, it's just a lot less work to leave them some honey for the winter. Um, not only that, the advantage is if I never feed them any sugar syrup, unless it's an absolutely dire emergency, then pretty much I know everything in this colony is honey, it's edible. If there's no chemicals in there, it's all edible. Um, if, you're, if you're the kind of person who's treating all the time, then you have this magical queen excluder that keeps all the chemicals below it because the bees never move anything, of course, right? Um, it's the no peeing section in the swimming pool down below the <laughs> excluder, and this magical queen excluder will keep all of that below. But then you have to keep track of, oh, well, that was down there, and I fed them fumadil which causes birth defects, and I fed them teramycin, which is an antibiotic, and I, I don't want to harvest any of that. And so it's much easier. If you, if you never feed anything that you don't want to eat, then you don't have to worry about what's, what's where in the hive. Um, this is just specifically on the concept of leaving them honey, but it's just that much less to extract and that much less trouble to feed them. This may be another issue, but again, I'll talk about I'll talk more about that one when we do uh, when I talk about uh, four simple steps to healthier bees. So I'll skip over that a little bit. This is a card I got from Brushy Mountain. I redid it a bit. I put a rack here. This wasn't there because I wanted to be able to stack up about six boxes and haul them across the pasture and not have them all fall off. Um, this has a hinge right here, so this arm swings out. So you back up to a stack of boxes. You have to kind of wiggle the boxes a little to get this angle iron under one side, and then you wiggle them a little to get this angle iron under the other side, and then this strap holds the handles together, and then it works like a wheelbarrow, which is kind of slick. I mean, it, it works pretty well, and the big wheel is nice because it doesn't fall in the holes uh, as much as a smaller wheel does. The bigger the wheel is, the more it rolls over little holes without you know, falling in. Um, this one is kind of nice. I use it now and then. I can't say I use it as much as this one, though. This is the Man Lake one. Um, I bought this. I bought this, and then I took it to the welder and had him put this rack on it again. And I had to move the axle because I run all mediums. It was really made to fit perfectly for a deep. This slips in the handles. There's a little spring-loaded half moon here and here. And then this is kind of angled so it slips right up on a box. So you just slip it up on a box, and then when you lift it up, those little things pop into the handles, and then it picks it up by the handles. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend, because I don't think that'll take the weight, I wouldn't recommend having six full boxes of honey on here, but you can put six empty boxes on here, and it works pretty well. And you could put two or three full boxes of honey on there, and it works pretty well. Um, so I had to, anyway, I had to move this. Uh, axle up a little bit to make up the difference between a, the handles on a deep box are, are here and the handles on a medium box are here and I need it to line up straight when I slip it up on there so that I'm you know, not tipped at a weird angle trying to pick them up. Um, but this is a pretty handy one. I kind of wish this handle was more this way a little further so that it would lift it up a little higher with me, without me having to bend over quite so far to do it. But um, I should do that one of these days. I keep meaning to and I don't get it done. I probably use this one more than any of the rest of them just because it'll just slip up on a stack of boxes and pick them up and off you go. You don't have to have any, there's nothing in particular you have to have under them. Um, 
because it, it picks them up by the handles. So if I've got a stack of boxes sitting there, I can just slip up on it and pick it up. Um, there's a guy in Arizona who actually invented this. Um, and I've seen a really old one. The year I bought this one from Man Lake, I went to, I went to Arizona. I was at D. Lusby's, and she had an old thing that was obviously a homemade thing that looked almost identical to that, except that it was they started out with a regular dolly and then build all this onto the front of it somehow. But um, all of this part looked exactly the same. And I said, you know, I just bought one like that from Man Lake. She says, yeah, they were just down here about a year ago taking pictures of this one. <laughs> so I don't know. I should get the guy's name up here, because I talked to the guy who actually invented this, and, and uh, I should give him credit. I wish they'd give him credit. I mean, it's, one, it's bad enough to just steal the idea, but you ought to at least give the guy credit. I suppose then they're, you're afraid he might want credit, want, want more than credit. This is the Walter T. Kelly nose truck. This, this slips under the highs here, but it doesn't quite reach all the way to the other side, so you have to have some kind of bottom board under it. So you have to, ideally, you'd probably make yourself some um, drip boards to use this effectively, which would probably be like a bottom board that's, that's got a wall all the way around so the honey won't run out, and then it has a, like a two by two on each end to keep it up off the ground so you can slip that nose under it to pick it up, or even a two by four if you want to make it a little taller. But um, if you put a drip board on there, then you could, when you're harvesting honey, you can stack up full supers all the way to the top, and whatever drips lands on that bottom board, and you just kind of slip under the board, tip it up, and roll it where you want to go. Um, but the disadvantage is if I just have a stack of boxes, it's a little trickier to get this under them if I don't have some kind of board that has something that holds it up where that Man Lake one, it just slips up and grabs it by the handles, so. Um, but this, this, you can put full supers all the way to the top and it'll handle the weight. You know, it's got dualies here and they're pneumatic, but they're, there's four tires there and it'll hold up, it'll hold up a full, you know, all the way full of honey. Um, in, in case you've never carried a heavy object very far, if you grab a honey super and, Think about this when you're deciding where to put your hives. Um, if you put, you put your hives where you can't drive up to them, then you're going to have to get the honey from there to the house. When you took the boxes down there, they didn't weigh very much. When you pick them up full of honey, they weigh quite a bit. So let's say you, let's say you went with eight frame mediums and you actually have a 50 pound box you're trying to carry back to the house. It's not too bad for the first 100 yards. The second 100 yards is a killer. <laughs> Uh, it just keeps getting heavier as you go, and your back just keeps getting tighter as you go. So carts are really nice for that. You put them on the cart, you can roll it to where you're going, and, and you don't wipe yourself out. Um, this seems to be a common problem, especially when people use plastic frames. And the reason it's a problem when you use plastic frames is because you have no thickness of a top bar. Um, back as far as the 1800s, um, pretty much they established that the thicker the top bar was, the less likely they would build burr between the boxes. And so they pretty much arrived at what a modern frame is now, the wooden frame, as that was a depth that would usually keep them from building burr between the boxes. Um, pretty much that needs to be somewhere between 7 eighths and an inch and a 16th, somewhere in there. After that, it's kind of a point of diminishing returns. There's no point making it deeper because you're not going to make much difference. But at 7 eighths, the difference between between a half and seven eighths is huge. And the difference between like a Pirco, which has almost no top bar, or any of the other plastic frames, because they have almost no top bar, is that they almost always build bird between the boxes. So what'll happen is you'll go out to get, pull your box off, and it won't come, it's trying to pick up the box below it, and it's stuck to all the frames in the one below it. And if you really get insistent and lift it, you have a whole row of frames hanging from the bottom of your box. So um, I just pry it up and, and go down the line and pop each one with a hive tool and pop them down. But now the question is, what do I do with that burr? I just leave it there. I don't see the point in getting rid of it. It's, the bees are just going to rebuild it anyway, and it makes a nice ladder for the queen to move up and down, and I just don't see the point of getting rid of it. So um, I just leave it. Now, anytime you got burr comb that's in your way, by all means, scrape it off, get it out of your way. But if it's not in your way, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, Similar, other burr comb, I mean, there can be burr comb not just between the boxes, but burr comb that's wherever. If it's not really in my way, and they're probably going to build it again unless I do something that's going to change 
the spacing in this high, they're just going to build it again. So I may as well, there's no point in me removing it unless it's in my way. I mean, if it's really in my way, by all means, get, it, get rid of it. And if it's something that's going to lead them to make more mistakes, uh, bees build parallel combs. So if you get some wild comb somewhere, they're probably going to build another wild comb right next to it because from their point of view, they build parallel combs and they're going to build parallel combs. So by all means, if something's just totally screwed up and it's going to lead to another one that's messed up, then don't, don't let them keep messing them up. Straighten, straighten them out and, and do something with them. But if it's just a little comb that runs off somewhere that, that uh, well, like on plastic, sometimes they build some stuff you do need to get rid of because they'll, they'll build little fins off of it this way, which aren't helping anything. Or they'll build this comb that comes out and runs parallel to it, which you can't get behind. So you about need to cut that one off and tie it in a, in a frame and, and uh, I don't know, figure out how to get them to draw on that plastic. That's a tough one. Uh, but I just, there's just not much point trying to cut every last bit of vercomb out or scrape every last bit of propolis off because they're just going to put it back. Um, and the propolis, there's really only, the only good reason to scrape propolis is if you're going to sell it. Cause, or, or it's in your way. If it's in your way, you know, scrape it off. But if it's not in your way, um, unless you're going to sell it, not only is it a waste of time, but Marla Spivak's research would say that the more propolis they have, the healthier the hive is. So you're just stealing things that would help make them healthy. You may as well just leave it there. Um, it's funny, isn't it, that we spent 150, 200 years breeding bees to not make propolis because it was too much trouble for the beekeepers, and now we know that it's a major impact on their health. Um, it seems like we're often doing the wrong thing. When I got started, I was reading all these old books that were in the libraries, and I, they were like Doolittle and Miller and C.C. Um, Miller, 50 Years Among the Bees. Um, and they were really... Uh, they were really big on you go out once a week and you look for swarm cells and you cut out every last swarm cell. Um, I tried that. I ended up with queenless hives. I don't know why they suggested that. I suppose they suggested that because they were raising their own queens and they were more interested in the comb honey and if they ended up queenless and they were checking them every week, they'd know if they were queenless, so they just put another queen in there, I guess. I don't know. It never worked out well for me. And, but even assuming it worked, it's extremely time consuming because you basically have to make sure you get every single swarm cell if this is your swarm control method. Um, and that's just uh, every single hive, every single week, all, all through the swarm season, that's just way too much work. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with that. Now, if you want to do some swarm control, that's a whole other topic. I would do swarm control because if you can keep them from swarming, you'll get a whole lot more honey than if you split them. But if, if they're trying to swarm, if I see swarm cells, I figure they're going to swarm and I split them because I, they're already too far down the line. They've already made up their mind and in my experience, it's not worth the effort to try to dissuade them. It's much easier just to do a split. Um, so once I see swarm cells, I don't destroy them, I just do a split. In fact, I might do a lot of splits because I like queens. And usually these are really well-fed queens, so I put each frame that's got a cell on it with a frame of honey and make another split and into a mating nuke and get a whole bunch of queens. But um, I don't cut swarm cells too much time. Um, I don't know how many times I see postings on forums of how do I make my bees and then fill in the blank. You know, how do I make my bees draw comb? How do I make my bees raise more brood? How do I make my bees, uh, well, Bottom line is you may be able to trick the bees into doing a few things, and it may be worth tricking them into doing a few things, but for the most part, you can't make them do anything, and most of the things you trick them into doing probably aren't going to help. Um, now, if you're going to raise queens, you kind of have to trick them into raising a whole, making a whole bunch of queens, and that's kind of the object of the game, but um, if you're trying to trick them into raising a whole bunch of brood way earlier than they should, it may not work out as well as you think it will. It might, I don't know. I'm not in your climate, and you'd have to figure out what works in your climate. But in my climate, if I trick them into raising a whole bunch of brood real early, then they get stuck on brood in a cold snap, and then they starve. And it usually backfires on me. It usually doesn't work out well. Um, generally, the, you need to change your view. You need to stop thinking in terms of how do I make the bees do something and start trying to figure out what are the bees trying to do and how can I help them do that, or how can I get out of their way so they can do that. You know, if there's something I'm doing or not doing that's impeding their ability to do what they're trying to do, then maybe I need to help them out. But there's, there's always the people 
who have the view that the bees are trying to do something they're not supposed to be doing. The bees are always doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're following their instincts that have worked well for them for millions of years, and they're going to keep following those instincts. No matter what you do, you may be able to, to leverage those instincts and fool them into things like raising more queens or whatever, but the reality is they're probably doing exactly what they should be doing. Um, if that's not convenient for you, then you need to figure out what you need to be doing to leverage that to your advantage, perhaps. Like if they're about to swarm, I don't really want to wait for them to swarm because I'm probably not going to be there when it happens and then I'm going to, they're going to be in the trees and I'd rather have them in my hives, so maybe I need to intervene. But, uh, but all in all, it's, it doesn't really pay to think in terms of how do I make them, how do, I make them do anything. Um, figure out what they're trying to do and help them or get out of their way. This is an interesting statement and I'd say there's probably two exceptions. One of them is when the, when the bees are swarming or they're already hanging in the tree, you probably need to do something now because there's a good chance they aren't going to be here later. Um, if they're being robbed, I would do something to stop it now, immediately. But almost anything else that's going on in the beehive will probably keep till tomorrow. So before you panic and do something really stupid, talk to your mentors, talk to your other beekeeping friends, Kick it around a little bit. You don't have to go do something right now. And if they aren't being robbed and they're not swarming, they'll probably still be there tomorrow and they'll probably be doing fine. And odds are they were probably doing what they were supposed to be doing and you should leave them alone. But assuming they need some kind of intervention, you need to make sure what you're doing is going to help. And quite often, uh, what you decide to do in a panic doesn't help. It makes things worse. So uh, I, I love this quote, you know. Uh, Matters are seldom made worse by doing nothing and often made much worse by inept intervention. So if you're not sure what to do, relax. Talk to your other beekeeping friends. I don't know how many times I've seen a posting on, on a bee forum where some guy says, I, 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 saw, I saw some queen cells and, and, I was, and, I, and I got scared and I destroyed all the queen cells. What do I do now? And everybody says, well, um, probably buy a queen. <laughs> um, but, but people see cells and they think they're going to swarm and they think that destroying them is going to save them from swarming. But if you see a capped queen cell in there, they probably swarmed yesterday. That's, that's the odds are. They might not have, but depending on the weather and whatever. But usually right after the first one gets capped, they swarm. So if you find a capped queen cell and you destroy it and, and you destroy all the queen cells, then they probably have no means of getting a queen now. So I, I would definitely think things over before you, before you act. Make sure you know what you're doing. I doubt that many of you wrap. You don't have that part of winners here, but maybe somebody does. I don't know. It's always baffling to me to have somebody from Florida write and say, it's going to get down to 30 tonight, and I'm, and I'm afraid the bees are all going to die. And I say, 30 below? <laughs> no, 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 30. Well, that's not cold. <laughs> that's not even winter. That's spring. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you can leverage heat to your advantage if you have a really bad um, climate. I think you can, but I, I will say this. Anything you do to try to help them as far as indoor wintering or giving them heat or whatever is more likely to cause problems than to solve problems because it's a tricky proposition. The bees are pretty, it's pretty simple to just let them take care of themselves, which they've been doing for millions of years in the trees. If you leave them alone, they can manage things pretty well. You start intervening, and then suddenly you, you, you create a stage that's unnatural, and they don't know how to deal with it. You know, If you give them too much heat, then they're too active, and then they're too short-lived, and then the next thing you know, they don't make it till spring because you kept them too warm. And it's, it's, they would probably be better at 20 degrees than they will at 50 degrees in the winter. So um, you, you probably should leave them alone. But if you, want, if you want to wrap them or you want to provide heat, you probably need to experiment on a small scale and figure out exactly how to go about it. I think it can probably be done in a way that can help them, but, it, but it's a pretty tricky proposition. If you talk to people who indoor winter bees, they're usually in Montana or Canada, and, and it's a tricky proposition. They have to try and keep it from getting too warm. They have to try and keep enough oxygen in there. They have to try and keep the moisture down. They have to, they have to manage a whole bunch of things that if they were outside, they wouldn't have to manage. But, um, but it probably does, if you manage all those things well, it probably does get more bees through the winter when you're in a place where it gets 40 below at night. Um, 
I don't think it ever gets 40 below here. You're, you're, you're supposed to be in the south. I know you get winter, but you know, it, it snows and it freezes, right? But what's the coldest you ever get around here? 10 below? Yeah, well, that's not too bad. That's, that's winter, though, yeah. If, if it was 10 below where I am, I'd call it cold. <laughs> if it was 27 below, I'd call it really cold. But um, yeah, you're, you're, that's, that's pretty cold. That's, you're just not close enough to the coast to get that kind of effect? Is that the? That's kind of rare. Yeah, well, in western Nebraska, I've seen 40 below, but only twice. Well, only two different winters. More than once, but in, during those two winters, but, but only two winters. Um, I think winter does have a decided uh, beneficial effect on bees. If you look at the top producers of honey, um, North Dakota is always one of the top producers of honey in this country. Um, and I think the bees do really well, actually, although it does kill off some hives. Um, the ones, the ones that survive really uh, seem motivated. I don't know. I don't know if it's the ones in Georgia just look at it as another day, <laughs> you know? I don't know. But, uh, but in Nebraska, as soon as things start blooming, it's like they're in a race with winter, and they're trying to, they're trying to get it done before winter sets in. Um, I think cold does have a beneficial effect to some degree, but it's also one of the hardest things to get them through. Um, I like what he said, the only time I ever really tried wrapping, it just seemed to seal in all the moisture. And I think moisture is your number one problem if you decide you're going to wrap. And that's the thing you need to deal with if you're, if you're going to do that, is to make sure that you don't create a, dis a, a disastrous, um, what, creating what amounts to a damp tomb for the colony. That's, that's my concern. Um, this will depend on your climate, I'm sure, but um, there's an awful lot of guys who just didn't believe in painting at all. Uh, Taylor was one of them, Miller was one of them, Doolittle was one of them. Um, me, I'm just lazy. They were convinced they'd actually last longer if they didn't paint them. I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, but it's definitely less work not to paint them. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a quote from Richard Taylor about not painting them. Yeah, he says, the highs need no painting, although there's no harm in doing it if their owner wants to please his own eye. Uh, And this is C.C. Miller. This is a short version. Um, I suppose they'd last longer if painted, but hardly enough to pay for the paint. Um, <laughs> he, he actually said in other places that he thought they'd last longer if he didn't paint them because he'd, he'd winter them in cellars, and when he'd bring them out in the spring, the ones that were painted were always all black with mold, and the ones that weren't painted were always nice and clean and, and, and didn't look moldy. So he was convinced they'd actually last longer if he didn't paint them. Of course, I'm not cellaring bees, so maybe that's part of the reason he thought they'd last longer. And Doolittle had the same opinion, and Miller would also quote Doolittle and say that he agreed with Doolittle, and then he'd say he didn't paint them. But um, I, in, in, in the, just, just to be uh, full disclosure here, I, I did buy a whole bunch of new equipment and decided I didn't want to try not painting all of it and, and, and uh, have it not last as long as possible. So I started dipping them in beeswax and gum rosin. So this is a cooker I bought from a guy who had his friend weld him up a bigger one. Um, it's just about the right size to fit a 10 frame box in and I have eight frame boxes. So I have a little bit of spare room, which is nice. Um, and I put beeswax and gum rosin in there. It's about two parts beeswax to one part gum rosin. And I cook them in there for like you're frying donuts, you know, you cook it for about 10 minutes and when you pull it out, it just kind of sucks all that wax right up into the wood. Um, and that seems to work pretty well, but I don't know if it's less work than painting, but um, I don't plan on ever doing it again and they seem to be holding up really well, so um, maybe all in all it'll be less work than painting. Uh, George Emery was just so sold on this uh, as a swarm control, he would swap boxes like every, what was he doing? Every week, or every two weeks, something like that. I don't remember. It's been a while since I read George's stuff. Um, he, he keeps swapping brood boxes all the way through the swarm season. And the idea is to, it forces the bees to keep rearranging the brood box all the time, and that tends to keep them distracted from swarming. 
and I'm sure it probably works, but it's an awful lot of work for me and an awful lot of work for the bees to keep rearranging the brood boxes, so I'm, I'm too lazy to do all that. The other version of swapping hive boxes is just the, the you do it once in the spring, you go through and you take all of your empty boxes and you put them on top. Well, there's nothing wrong with that as long as there's no brood in that and you're not breaking up the brood nest, it's probably not gonna hurt anything, but it's a lot of work. If I happen to be at the bottom box and it's empty, I put it on top because I'm lazy. That When I come back, I can look in that box and see when it's full so I know when to add another box and that's just simpler for me. But if it's still on the bottom and I haven't got around to it, I don't care if I swap them or not, they'll, they'll move down. This idea that bees only move up is, is a myth created by the fact that we keep creating empty space over their heads. If, if you talk to anybody who's doing a war a hive, and if they're following Worry's book, basically they keep adding boxes to the bottom. And you know where the bees go? They go down. Why? Because that's where the space is. If you add the boxes to the top, they go up. Why? Because that's where the space is. When they move into a tree, they have no choice but to start at the top and work down because that's the way the tree goes. I mean, you, the cluster at the top, you start building comb that's attached to the top and you build down until you get to the bottom. I, to say that bees only work up or that they only work down are both fallacies. Bees work to wherever there's space. If there's space, they'll go fill it. They don't, they don't care where the space is. If it's over their head, then they're gonna go up. If it's underneath, they're gonna go down. Um, now, you do create a dilemma if you got this empty brood box here and you didn't do anything with it and you piled a bunch of supers on, now there's space below them and above them and they have to choose. And there's no telling what they'll choose because every colony is its own, you know, they make their own decisions. They may decide to go down first and then when they run out of space, start going up or they may just decide to keep going up because that's, where, that's the direction they were already headed and uh, sometimes they have trouble deciding to change direction. So if they were already starting to build up and you had some space, then they'll just, they might just keep going up and leave that box, bottom box empty, or they might, if they were already going down, they might just keep going down and fill that bottom box even though you put the supers on. But if you don't put the supers on until they start working that bottom box, you got better assurance they're gonna, they're gonna fill it and then keep going up. Um, anyway, I don't, I don't bother to do this, it's just too much work. But this is, this is a, um, Richard Taylor quote on the topic. Um, he, I, I, his last line is, in any case, I've long since found that such planning is best left to the bees. That's probably the short version. Um, the, the idea is that you're gonna somehow induce her to lay more eggs and, and, and keep them from swarming, but I don't know if it really makes a difference. This is a huge one. Now, I'm, I'm gonna recommend, though, that before I say this, that you, you need to all buy an observation hive. You need to put it in your living room. You need to run a tube out the door, or out the window. You know, if you take a sash window, you just take a one by four under the window, a one by four under the storm window, and drill the hole, run the tube out, you have it right there. It's BTV. For what, for what you pay, for what you pay for two months of cable, you could probably buy one. And you won't need cable anymore because you'll have something far more entertaining. You can watch the bees when you get up in the morning while you're drinking your coffee. You can watch them when you get home from work at night. You can find a queen 10 times a day um, without any effort at all. And if you don't mark her, you'll get really good at spotting her. You'll get where you can just spot her like that. In fact, your kids will be able to do it. Your grandkids will be able to do it. They'll just be able to walk up and go, there she is. Because you start learning not just what the queen looks like, but what the bees around her look like and what the pattern looks like. And you get so you can just glance at it and you go, ah, oh, she's right there. And, and you do need to learn to find a queen, but the problem is you also need to learn how not to find the queen. You need to learn how to avoid the need to find the queen or you'll never get your bee work done. If you're out there looking through every hive trying to find the queen all the time, you're never gonna get anything done. Um, I, I guarantee you if you get to 200 hives like I've got and, you, and you're out there trying to find queens every day, you won't get anything done. You'll just be busy finding queens all the time. Um, even if you're good at it, it's time consuming. But um, I would say you start trying to plan all your work so that you don't need to find the queen. There's an awful lot of things you can do where typically they tell you to go find the queen, but you can find a way to avoid that. Now, one of the ways you avoid that is you start raising your own queens. If you start raising your own queens, you've got all sorts of options you didn't have before. You wanna requeen this hot hive, you can just stick a queen cell in there, and odds are it'll emerge, it'll supersede the old queen, and you never even had to find her because the new queen's just gonna take over. Um, you can't do that with a queen in a cage because they'll just kill her. If you buy a laying queen and stick her in there, they'll, they'll just kill her. There's no hope of that. But if you stick a cell in there, there's a fair chance that it'll just emerge and you'll have a supersedure. Um, 
So there's a lot of ways you can avoid finding queens. Like I'm setting up mating nukes, I'll look on the frame to see if I see a queen, but I don't really, if I miss her, I'm not really worried about it. I'm gonna give them all a cell, they're all gonna end up with a queen anyway. So one way or another, there'll be a queen in there when I'm done. Um, if I do splits, I, I don't do splits where I care where the queen is. I just do walk away splits where I don't care where the queen is and it'll all work out. Um, if I had to find her, it, it would take me hours and hours and hours to do one yard. And as it is, I can walk into a yard and split the whole yard in about an hour and move on to the next yard. Um, what was the question? When? Um, I'll, ideally, probably about the middle of May. Maybe a little earlier. It depends on the year. Some years spring comes early and some years spring comes late. But that would be a typical year in my location. But I'm guessing I'm at least two weeks behind you guys. So that's probably more like the first of May, maybe a week before that if it's an early spring, or maybe two weeks before that if it's a really early spring. Once in a while you get a spring that's almost a month early, but um, this is another big time saver is, is this, let's, let's say you're in an out yard, you wanna requeen this hive in an out yard for whatever reason, maybe it's too hot, maybe whatever. So I go find the queen and I kill the queen, and now I need to introduce a queen. Um, if it's 60 miles to an out yard, I'm not going to wait till tomorrow, because i I got to make another trip if I do that. So I'm probably going to eat my lunch, which will give them an hour or two to figure out their queen list, and then I'm going to put the cage in there with the cork popped on the candy in, and I'm not coming back. Probably not coming back till next year. Um, I'm not going to worry about it. I've, I'm done. Um, but the typical recommendation would be that you take the queen out, you wait till tomorrow, and now at least one of the bee scientists I know would recommend that then you put the cage in there with the cork still in there and you wait four days, and then you come back and you take the cork out and poke a hole in the candy and put it back, and then you come back in four days and make sure she got out and see if she's laying, and if she's not, then you come back in about a week and see if she's laying, and I'm not going to do any of those things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this all in one sitting at one trip because I don't have time for all that. Um, so it's, if it's convenient, by all means, wait. If it's in your backyard, it may not be any big deal one way or the other to wait till tomorrow to do it. But if it's 60 miles away, it's a huge difference. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wait if there's, a, if there's a really good chance. If it doesn't really change the odds that much, I would go ahead and just do it. I often set up mating nukes and put the queen cells in when I set them up. In theory, I ought to leave them overnight to be queenless and then put them in tomorrow, but, um, but that's another trip. I probably won't. I'll probably just do them the same day because it really won't change the odds enough to be worth the trouble. Maybe one or two of those queen cells will get, will get torn down because I did them all today, but uh, probably not, but maybe. But probably not more than that. Now. I want, I want you to understand exactly what I mean here. There's a difference between dry sugar and syrup, and it also depends on the time of year, what's useful. This time of year, dry sugar isn't of much use. Um, in fact, this time of year, feeding isn't of much use right now. You got things blooming out there. I don't see much point in feeding right now. But um, in winter, the nice thing about feeding dry sugar is that they can take it even when it's too cold to drink to take syrup. You can't really feed syrup in the winter. You can feed dry sugar in the winter. So um, part of the reason I started doing more dry sugar is I started harvesting later and later. If I, I got to where I just harvest after it got cold and the bees are all clustered and I don't have to run them out of the supers. And I, I don't usually feed, I usually just leave them enough honey. But if they're short and if I need to give them something to make sure they're gonna get to spring, I can put dry sugar on at that point, but it's already getting too late really to feed them enough, to feed them syrup, get them to put that away and get it capped and get it all ready for winter. Um, so I end up feeding dry sugar. It's a lot simpler. I don't have to make syrup. Um, it doesn't have the same effect on a hive. When you feed sugar syrup, they tend to view it as a nectar flow. When they see dry sugar there, unless you get it clumped up, they may just view it as garbage and start hauling it out the door. And if you get it clumped up where they can't haul it out the door easily, then they'll probably just view it as, oh, well, there's something we could eat. Well, if we need to, but 
they don't they don't try to store it necessarily. It just kind of it sits there until they until they need it or until the cluster's up in contact with it. In the winter, they'll eat it. Um, but it's a lot less work than syrup. This is how I feed dry sugar generally. I put a newspaper on here. Some people tell me this doesn't work in their climate. You got to cut this newspaper off, or it'll wick water in there. But it doesn't rain enough where I live, or snow enough to matter. But maybe it'll matter where you are. I just leave it hanging out there. Um, I, this, the newspaper ended right there because I have a top entrance. They got to be able to get out the top. So this is how they get out. So I pile the sugar in here. I usually put a little layer and spray some water on it to get it clumped up, and another layer and some more water to get it clumped up. And then I'll spray this front edge enough to get it actually wet so that the bees that come up to investigate will figure out that it's food because I don't want the house bees to come up and just start hauling it out for trash. First time I tried to do high, dry sugar, that's exactly what happened. I put dry sugar on because somebody told me it was a great idea. I didn't do any of these other details. I just dumped the sugar on there. I come back out the next day and there's a pile of sugar in front of the hive. And, and they're just working their, they're just working like crazy hauling that sugar out the door, and dumping it on the ground. Um, so you might want to do some things to make sure they realize it's food and make, and make it clumped up enough that it's difficult to haul out the door. Um, this works really well with 8-frame mediums. It does not work well with 10-frame deeps. So I'm not recommending this with 10-frame deeps. But if you've got 8-frame mediums, um, you have a nice distribution of resources. Because an 8-frame medium is basically the same size as five deep frames. So you've got basically two of those, two 8-frame mediums this is the same as one deep. So four 8-frame mediums is the same as two deeps. So if you've got four 8-frame mediums full of bees and brood and honey, then probably this top box is honey, this next box is mostly honey, the next box is almost all brood, and the next box is almost all brood. So if I put a bottom board down and a bottom board down, and I say one for you and one for you and one for you and one for you, I just gave them a box of honey and a box of brood and a box of honey and a box of brood, roughly. may not be exact, but it's pretty close. So the, so the resources get fairly evenly distributed, and I didn't open up a box and look for anything. Now. I'll caveat that. If I did that in the first couple of weeks of May, I've got a really good chance that there's brood in both of them because otherwise the hive wouldn't be doing this well. And, and I could probably get by with not looking in there at all. If I do this at the middle or, the, or late May, I'm getting into where they might have swarmed. So I probably would pick up each of these boxes and look on the bottom for swarm cells. And if I don't see any, I'll probably figure they're not trying to swarm, and they probably didn't swarm, because even if they had swarmed, I'd probably at least see some open cells or some chewed down, you know, torn up cells or something. So if I don't see any indication that they might have swarmed, I'll probably still just do it by the box. If I see any indication they might have swarmed, then I'm going to make sure that both halves have at least some open brood, because I don't know where the virgin queen is, and I don't know how that's going to work out, so I want to make sure they have the means to come up with a queen. So then I'm probably going to look some other box and pull a frame of brood with some eggs and young larvae and put it in each of those boxes if I don't see any in there. I might look, but probably, probably if I got queen cells under there, there's a good chance they don't have any that's the right age. So I'm probably going to have to make sure they do. So pretty much I'm going to, the more it gets into where it might be swarm season and the more they might have swarmed, the more I'm going to have to make sure that, that they both have the means to make a queen because I don't know. But uh, if I do that early, I can usually do that split and works fine. Um, and I can walk into a yard and split the whole yard in probably an hour. Just start throwing down bottom boards and dealing out boxes and, and work my way through the whole yard. Um, it's pretty fast. Are they? Well, that's, that's the only trick is if they're getting ready to swarm. I, and that's why I would look on the bottoms as I'm picking up the boxes to see if there's any swarm cells on the bottom. Not all swarm cells will be on the bottom, but odds are if they're swarming, there'll be at least some swarm cells on the bottom. And so that's a pretty good indicator that I need to make sure that they've got some brood they can raise a queen from, because they may not. Or make sure they've got some queen cells. If, if I see queen cells that, are, that aren't torn open, that are just still queen cells, and I just make sure they both have queen cells. I'm, that's fine. If I 
if they look torn open and or and or you know look like a queen emerged from it, well then then I got to make sure they both got brood because there's probably a virgin queen running around in here somewhere, but there's not there's likely not two of them. So yeah, well yeah, swarm cells are queen cells, yes, <laughs> but swarm cells are usually they tend to be on the bottom, and so they, they, there's usually I'm going to see some hanging off the bottoms. So if you picked up a bottom and looked, you'll probably see some queen cells, at least on some of these boxes, if they, if they were swarming any time lately. So anyway, that's my synopsis. Um, I want to see how I'm doing. I got, um, I've got about another hour, don't I? Why don't we, uh, I assume there's a bathroom around here and we should take a break, right? No, I don't, I'm not looking for it. I just uh, figured, figured it was that time.